will, will be in English. I'm really pleased to be hosting the event, um, this webinars, the series of three. This is the last one um, on our time zones today um, to share with you our new platform for walkable communities, to hear from the actors around the globe who are taking action to make a difference for walking and to invite you to contribute to this new open resource that we have been developing to uh, support walking. I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the platform and an overview of the pathways, its origins and its ambitions. And then we'll hear from a local adv advocate to set the scene about conditions for people walking and then three case studies uh, to illustrate exemplar actions which are underway to improve walking and walkability in this uh, America's region of the world. Now, I appreciate when I call her a local advocate, she's local only to her, her place. Um, and there's not necessarily a direct correlation between her experience and some of the other cities in the region, but we're deliberately joining up the different parts of the globe in this way and learning from different cities. It's a snapshot into the context in which people are working and the case studies. Because we uh, are focusing on the governance of walking, then that opportunity for learning between, uh, between the different agencies. So this started as an idea prompted by the COVID-19 pandemic, which highlighted the need for walking and places to walk. But it also revealed a gap in visible data about walking and spurred a number of projects of which this is, is one to start to address that. We've been working to fill that knowledge gap with the Pathways platform and other projects to improve the visibility of existing knowledge, celebrate the good practice that is happening and inspire more investment in, in walking and walkability. So what's critical to understand from the beginning is that we're focusing on the governance models, policies, action plans, investments and ambitions within administrations rather than the, uh, the delivery on the street. Obviously that is the ultimate outcome for people to have a better street to work, uh, to walk in, but it's the walk behind the scenes by administrations to embed policies, because what COVID showed us, those that had embedded policies could act uh, more quickly. We wanna grow momentum um, for walkability by recognizing those first steps governments can take to deliver better environments. And rather than judging by change on the, the street, we want to take this holistic view um, around how the, are embedding the value of walking as part of the approach to managing streets and public spaces, our urban lives and the transport systems. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, financial support of the FIA Foundation for this work, who has enabled us to put together both the online resource and bring us together today in these webinars. So we're going to have a series of speakers um, and we can take questions in the chat as we go. Feel free to engage in the chat. Spe our speakers will as well. Um, but after our different speakers, we will have a general discussion at the end. Um, for some of those questions. So feel free to drop your thoughts into the chat and uh, be part of the participation there as well. So as I've explained briefly, the background to this project and the three core things that we're wanting it to do is to recognize action, reward and promote towns and cities, to make that uh, investment and value of walking visible, inspire more ambition about how administrations take action and to celebrate the impact they're having by showcasing the good practice and exemplar interventions that are out there, but people just don't know and hear about it enough, despite even our best efforts to promote walking through our resources. And it's to grow momentum. And this is another, I, I bring this slide up particularly because in developing up the pathways, we also in parallel developed this resource, which was launched earlier this year called Walking and Cycling in Africa, Evidence and Good Practice to Inspire Action. And the ambition of this report, which we did in um, collaboration with UN Habitat and UN Environment, was to source local best practice examples. So Africa can learn from Africa that they can, again, this is where we started with this concept of daylighting and highlighting um, so that it's not always a sense that, oh, they, that only happens in Amsterdam or Vienna, of course, was always lovely and walkable, that it's possible at different cities at different scales and in different starting points. And um, this resource is available online and you'll see, you'll find in there some of the imagery and data that uh, I'll talk about that is also available on our platform. Um, uh, and it's something that we are looking and hoping to develop for the other regions uh, globally as well. So this is how we're hoping to, to grow momentum through this work. So the platform is, is on the Walk21 website. It's called the Pathways to Walkable Cities. Um, and it's composed of three core areas that 
uh, you can find out information. The first one is the International Charter for Walking. Walk21 hosts the International Charter for Walking. We launched it in Melbourne in 2006, and it's been signed um, by over 10,000 people globally, different mayors and ministers, national transport agencies and individuals as well. And we felt since we were mapping uh, commitment and engagement with walking, then we would we would draw up our, our learnings and our engagement through the uh, International Charter, because this has been a key document back in 2006, when we were still growing the conversation about walking around what was needed, how to set a strategic vision, what, what we had to do. The uh, Charter for Walking set out a really clear set of ambitions and actions that has guided many communities in their journeys to more walkability. The second key issue, as I've mentioned already, was the data gap. What do we know? How do we find out more and know enough about walking? And everyone will talk to you about counting and making sure we have numbers and information. But what we looked at in designing and measuring walking, we some groups were coming up with 247 different indicators or three tiers of 36 indicators. And these more complex systems are critical for when you're trying to do some fine grain. But this lack of data or this complexity was also uh, being a barrier for people to actually feel enabled to go out and understand walking more fully in their communities. And so what we decided to do at Walk21 was to look at what, well, what have Instead of saying we had to find the data, go out and measure on the ground, what do we know already from the existing global databases? So we went to the WHO, World Health Organization, they had databases um, around policy, activity and safety. Uh, the road safety statistics are hosted by them. They, the International Road Assessment Program have a fantastic resource around the infrastructure uh, globally uh, around the world, they have star ratings for roads, if you're not aware of what they do. And so we call this comfort, like they have amazing stats that 83% of roads that people are walking on in the African continent don't have a sidewalk. That's already not safe and not comfortable and, and, and throws up a, a whole range of issues. Um, some of which we explored in our in our webinar early today. Um, and we, we tagged that as comfort. And then we also extended the, the starting point from WHO around policy and did our own research into all the different policy frameworks at a national and sub-national level. And um, you'll be hearing more from us next year around the national policies, particularly with our focus on our work uh, at the global level to inspire national governments to invest as well as local cities and administrations. So this developed up these radar diagrams or spiders as some people call them, and we, we scored against those five criteria to start to just get an understanding. Now you might argue with these numbers and we're very happy if you do. We've just done a first, put something on paper and we've already garnered a response to that. So we're very willing, this is an evolving document. We want your input and your ideas and it might be, we will be seeking to keep these stats up to date as the databases and the resources become available. But data is an ever, ever resolve, uh, evolving resource. Um, and we will be looking at how these different databases are updated and how we can keep this informed. And then the third dimension of the platform, which is what we're going to be focusing on today, because this is where we are here, which is about the best practice that is happening inside our cities and uh, the administrations, either at a regional or at a, a, at a city level. And we have, it's about the good governance for good practices. We've captured a few, we've, we've uh, populated the database with some examples already, but this is by no means um, all of it. And certainly in, we can have more than one example from, from any one country or any one city, and we want to um, expand that work and then start to carousel and promote it um, as we evolve the platform. We've built the, the groupings around um, to sort of prompt action around this. We have a program called our Eight Steps to Walkable Cities, which we've run with cities like Rotterdam and um, workshops with, in Manila and with cities in the Asian region. And this is trying to capture having looked at how cities actually deliver for walking. What are those core elements that need to happen? And we call it a pathway and we present it like this because it's not a series of chronological steps. So we can't call it steps because that suggests one has to follow the other. You might do one or two or three in one go. Some cities have started at number eight as I've displayed it here and then come back and done number two. And some cities have done everything without a plan and, and, and achieved great, great amounts. So, but when you look at, at, at these different elements, they really help a comprehensive policy package. And that's getting that top level commitment, that stake, that 
political and high level executive commitment to doing something about walking. We see that consistently. It can't be the only thing, but it's definitely that starting point that really starts to make a difference. Do the research about who walks and why they walk and where they go and understand your, your, uh, your, your customer base. And then involve that customer base, understand their needs and, and what they want and how they can engage with the process, assess the environment, understand the physical constraints within which they are being asked to walk or being invited to, to walk more than perhaps they would. Review the policy, legal guidance, all of the layers of legislation and policy, strategic plans, transport plans that may, might constrain or enable the potential for the walkability actions. Berlin introduced some new laws around walkability. These, these laws can actually stifle uh, the thing, national laws, like not being able to act on footpath parking can actually stifle local action. And so you have to know where all of those parameters are as part of this process. And then the planning. Now the plan, this says here to plan, it sounds like an end result, but the end result is the multidisciplinary teams, the preparation, engaging people so they have a sense of ownership of what you want to achieve. Sometimes people don't even realize they have something to contribute to making a more walkable um, city. And that engagement, that process is often more important than the end product. But as we heard from Robin Davies from Queensland, getting to that end product, having the first strategic plan has, at They've been able in the last two years to leverage resources, not just for building, but also for local planning and action to support walkability. So some really great results from getting a plan in place to leverage investment and resources and action across there, across Queensland. And then, of course, proving investment in infrastructure, prove that these ideas work. And I think we'll hear about some of those um, today, but actually deliver something, not just big paradigm shifting things like Times Square, but sometimes cities do little pieces of acupuncture and make lots of little small changes, putting in sidewalk crossings or something like this, it really helps it uh, improve things for people. And then finally, of course, investment, not just in that single paradigm shifting idea or project, but ongoing consistent funding streams to ensure that walkability becomes part of the, the way you do business in, the, in your city. So these are the practices that we've captured on the, the platform. And this is an example from Vietnam, but this is to illustrate um, to you how we present. So this is the radar diagrams for each national context within which the best practice case studies are happening. And then the case studies are captured down the side. And as I said, we're gonna continue evolving and developing how we present and share this information with you to continue that process of, of daylighting and highlighting good practices for walking. And that is nearly the end for me, except to say that this is about you and putting your policy on the map. It's not just about the people we've invited to speak today, though we're very grateful to them for joining us. But it's also about hearing from you to share the good work happening in your community, to promote the pathway to your administrations to in, and local advocates. Um, and practitioners to participate in the platform to support peer-to-peer -peer learning and cross-disciplinary collaborations um, by, through the examples that we've been sharing and to reward administrations and communities for taking action. There are sometimes the best work that is happening for walking is happening from community inspired groups rather than uh, from administrations and we've seen some really good examples in the different webinars today cities like Singapore are delivering because they need to for transport efficiency and effective you know city management but other communities um, are inspired that politicians are inspired by local advocacy to deliver or governments are actually enabling advocacy organizations to deliver so we we are very interested in the processes and the governance for how we deliver on these things and we want to reward and continue to um, share that with you all so that's it from me it's I get now to listen along with all of you to our great speakers and we're going to start with um, the advocate who is Leticia Sabino she'll be known to some of you if you've been to Walk 21 she's the founder and director of San Pepe um, an NGO, and I'm going to read this out because it's such a lovely uh, way she's described it, focused on improving walking experiences in cities and building more walkable cities together with people. But she's also a dreamer and mobilizer of the Open Street Program in Sao Paulo. And we have to remember to dream because we know things can be better. And by dreaming and taking action is how we can deliver. So over to you, Letitia, to share your story. I'm just trying to find my can you stop my sharing, Ralph? My mouse has gone AWOL. Thanks. Letitia, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Brown, and thank you for the introduction and for inviting us to present here the context. Uh, I will show a little bit of the context of Brazil, but I think it's similar in the region, like in Latin America region, but the data is more in Brazilian uh, context. And as you said, we are a nonprofit organization led by women and we have been working 10 years uh, already in Brazil in promoting walkable environment with participatory methodologies. And so let's talk about walking in Brazil. First, I just want to show like Brazil is a big country. We have uh, 213 million people and more than 5,000 municipalities which means a very complex uh, territory to do with this, this topic. And to show how big we are, like we are known to be a continental size country. This map, you can like have the size of Brazil overlap all the region in the, the, the world. And as we can see, like Brazil is as big as the whole Europe region. So it means we have like different culture, different food, different climate, and different many things in the whole country to try to manage. And also all those municipalities that we have, the majority are small cities, what for us is up to 100,000 people. But even though 94% of our municipalities are small cities, 60% of the population lives in only 6% of the cities, which are the medium size and the big cities. And for us, big cities is just when they are over uh, of 800,000 people. And in this uh, context, we have uh, the majority of daily commute in all our cities made exclusive, exclusively on foot. That means even when people take like public transport, it's not considered in this data. So 39% of the daily commute are made exclusively walking in our cities, which much more than what are the cars or public transport commute. So that's a very important data on working on walkability in Brazil. And we have to do some intersectionality when we talk about walking because women walk much more than men and we have this data on our cities. So these are our only examples from the Northeast, the South of Brazil showing that even when the context change, still women walk more. And we also have to intersect with lower income. So people with lower income walk much more than people with higher income. So this is also just an example of Salvador, a specific city that they have this data. But as you can see, when we go to non-motorized uh, trips and lower income, that's much, much higher than the other context. And unfortunately, we can't say about uh, race and color intersection because we don't have this data still, like the, the research in Brazil don't catch this, what is the problem on planning uh, our policies. But walking is very different than walkability. So even though the majority of people are walking, I will show just some pictures of the reality on the walkability and infrastructure in Brazil. This repeat like it's repeated in all our cities. And basically because cars are still seen as privilege and the main mode of transport. So we have this kind of sidewalks mainly because of cars, because the car have to get in the house. So it doesn't matter, people are gonna walk in this infrastructure, always build up on the car entering in the house. And this repeat a lot. We also have like a lot of high highways uh, in the urban area, which makes like building this massive infrastructure to make pedestrians safe, what is not safe at all for pedestrians, and it shows just like the opposite. And also other contexts that we don't have accessibility, space, and always the priority for cars instead of people. And this will result in a very like, uh, sad data that we also have, that we have a lot of people that are victims of traffic accident while walking in our cities. So this is the number for year. The, the first number, what is the name number of victims? And the second one is the ones that were fatal. So we still have to 
defeat this massive problem in the region. And also besides the infrastructure, we also have a big problem on not accessing things on 15 minutes walk, what also makes our cities not walkable. So this was a research made in the national level too, to ask people what they could access in 15 minutes walk. And as we can see, like the, the major things as education, work, access to parks are still very few in the whole country, what is also a problem when we think about walkability. And, but when we say like unsafe and walkable cities are bad for everyone, some people, some groups are more affected than others. So also some very worrying data about children, for example, that uh, the main cause of death of children zero to 14 years old are traffic accidents and the big portion uh, while walking. Also, we have like for group of women and other, other impacts of not accessing jobs or education because of commuting barriers in the country. And when we say about elderly are also one big group that are queued as pedestrians and fatal accidents while walking. And, but besides that, we have a massive like walking policy is already in the country. What was like built since the constitution that we have the freedom to move around. So how do we build this freedom? So 10 years later, approximately, we developed this highway code. What said that all other vehicles have to care for the safety of pedestrians. What we don't really see, but it's still in the law for a long time. And after that, we decided we in the country it started developing some urban policies because before it was all discussed in the national level, but not dis differing what was urban and rural. And since two thousand one, we have the city statute that started saying urban areas need a different way of planning itself and a local plan to develop. So this was the first time it said we need an integrated urban transport plan. And after that, we have a very like a milestone for thinking walkability and urban mobility in Brazil. What is the national urban po mobility policy in 2012 that finally and for the first time put the priority on planning urban mobility in our cities on non-motorized modes of transport over motorized. But finally, since and means in our law, at least, this should be the priority of our cities, putting the pedestrian first and then bikes and then public transport and at the end, the cars. And in some cities, this is more a local policy. Uh, it was developed pedestrian statutes, what is also a very interesting way of uh, promoting a law in a local level. We'd say who are the pedestrians and also establish rights and that is of pedestrians and cities. And it was the first time also in the local law that other infrastructures were combined to show what would be a good city for pedestrians. So for the first time, it also presented that public lighting is, a, is an issue, that road crossing should be planned for walk, walk, working, walking also urban furniture to be comfort and accessible. And here are some examples of the cities that already have their pedestrian statues. And finally, we also have in every Brazilian city, the sidewalk laws that show how sidewalks should be built. But more than that, unfortunately, this kind of law passed the responsibility of sidewalk infrastructure to the citizens. So, our local governments are not responsible for the sidewalks. They are just responsible on seeing if the sidewalk is according to this law and those norms, what don't really happen in the practice. But we have a very important issue on governance of our sidewalks and infrastructure. And just to show, we have many other policies that cross over like walking cities, like road safety, climate action plans, urban strategic plans, also a national inclusion law. What, what seems a lot of plans that a lot of times and cities, the, the people who work in the daily 
planning, don't even know what are in the plan, what is also an issue of the region. And as I could show right with data and photos, with you can, could realize that our policy does not reflect what our cities are in our reality. And definitely we don't still don't have a budget priority and an integrated vision of actions. So some actions that are needed to develop a walkability in the region and in Brazil is a review on govern, gov, governance, like the sidewalk governance, creating some walking authorities that we still don't have in our cities. And also because we have so many plans, the monitoring of those plans in a transparent and public ways, and also develop some participatory methodologies and give more budget for community actions too what are not done right now. And thinking about actions, we could like lower urban speed. We should share to change the street distribution and share, create some car free zones. Definitely forbid urban highways and implement seating and lighting as a strategy in our cities and not like just some points. And also create solutions on crossing and guarantee 15 minute walk access, at least for health, education and green zones to everyone. And, but even though I've shown the, the contacts are not very positive in the reality, we could uh, map in the last year, some good examples, what, how walkability is already being promoted on cities. And we developed um, a prize in a national level that we, invited all the cities and municipalities to apply with their projects on the last eight years that have promoted walkability in their local context. And basically it's the same goal of the, the map that Walk21 is also promoting, that is recognition, inspire different governments and promote exchange of those projects. And what we could find out is that we have very, very good projects. So we found already 28 good projects in almost all the region. What was very impressive for us, and it's a very important mapping. And one of those cases that will be presented here is the one that uh, won the prize for big city. So we had the, the prize for small cities, medium cities, and big cities what we also could recognize uh, different uh, scales of actions. And the, the walkability municipal plan for Fortaleza, that won the first in the prize, but is a very good example, will be presented soon. So that's it. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Leticia. That's a really great overview of the context in, in Brazil and uh, Sadly, that breakdown between national policies and, and ambitions and legislation and uh, the reality on the on the street as well. But really lovely capturing of, of actions and ideas. This, this sidewalk thing, it's a very, uh, I remember running into that in North America, that the government didn't have a responsibility for sidewalks and the consequences are very clear to see when you try to walk around in those communities. Thank you so much. You gave us the perfect segue um, to our next speaker who is Deborah Monte from the City Lab Manager in the city of Fortaleza. We'll stay in Brazil and hear all about their walkability master plan. Uh, so Deborah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us today. And don't forget the mute button. Are you all seeing my screen? We can hear you now, but we did see your screen, but it's gone away again. Can you share it again? Is that, or is that only me, Ralph? Is it everyone? It's everyone. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll be present. Yes. I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay, so now we can see your screen, but you seem to be muted. So, um, if you can unmute, 
without losing the screen. There we go. Great. Oh, no, we lost you. There we are. Thanks, Debra. Let's go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep, that's great. Please proceed. Thank you. I'm sorry for the delay. My name is Debra Braga. Debra Monti, also, I have two last names. I, I am the manager of the City Lab uh, in Fortaleza, Office of Environmental and Urbanism. And I will be presenting the Municipal Walkability Master Plan of Fortaleza, a project made by our office from the City Hall. To introduce the theme of walkability in Fortaleza, we have to talk about the issue caused by designing cities for automobiles. And to sum up this issue, I have to quote a phrase said by Gail in 2015, that which is, for decades, the human dimension has been forgotten and became a neglected topic in most cities urban planning. While several issues become more and more severe, such as accommodating the vertiginous increase of car traffic, as we can see in both pictures that I brought today on this slide, which illustrates Los Angeles and Sao Paulo. And the main issues of urban mobility today that we have in most big cities, as such as Fortaleza, are traffic jam, pollution, and car accidents. Brazil has the sixth largest, largest vehicle fleet in the world. And Fortaleza also has an enormous vehicle fleet with around 1.2 vehicles transitating in the city. 1.2 million vehicles, I'm sorry. And the pollution caused by this car traffic generates over 22% of the emission of GHGs worldwide, which is an emission of gas, which causes global warming. And in Fortaleza, this emission, uh, this car emissions are over more than half responsible by cars, the GHG emissions. And the car accidents are a, a problem that we are trying to solve in our mobility office in the city hall, but still in 2020, we had over 12,000 12, 12, uh, registered car accidents, which caused 188 fatal victims in this year. To locate for Well, that's comprehensive. Um, oh, you're back. Yeah, you're back. Great. You completely disappeared Hi. on us. Yeah. Do you want to try and share your screen again? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. These things happen. It must have the connection. Okay, so we have your presentation back. And now you can hear me? Perfect. Yeah. Please keep, please keep going. God. I'm sorry for these troubles. Did you listen to the last slide? Oh, yeah, you just shared with us about the, the car accidents and the, the fatalities. Yeah. Oh. What's happening? I don't know what's happening. Okay. I, uh, just keep going. We'll just see how we get on. Yeah, we just maybe move to the next slide and we can keep going and hope it stays connected. Okay. And continually, I'm sorry for the troubles. It must be the connection. Uh, we have... Okay. Okay. 
Okay, Deborah, it does keep dropping out. I wonder, there we are with the maps. Oh. Now. Now we have you, but not the slides. Do you think, do you have an alternative way that you can connect to the internet or is this your best option? Yes. No, I can, I can see if the... Okay, now we have lost you again. Um, I think the best thing is to see if you can and get, can you, if you can hear me. Um, oh, we have your slides back. No. All right, let's give it one last we try and see. If, yes, we can. Okay. This will be my last try. I, I won't bother you anymore if it, it keeps going like that. Let's okay. see. Let's see. Um, and to locate Fortaleza on the map for you guys, we've brought the map of South America locating Brazil and locating the state of Ceará, which is our state in the map of Brazil and the location of Fortaleza, with, which is the capital of Ceará in the north, Northeast region. And to describe Fortaleza main aspects, I brought the map of the surface temperature of our city, along with some characteristics of our city. Fortaleza is the capital city of Ceará, a state located in Brazil Northeast region. It's the fifth largest city in Brazil with a population of 2.7 million residents and 40% of this population main means of transport is on foot. And we have to even to trouble more the life of this population that walks by feet in our city. We have a warm subhuman tropical climate and the temperatures in the city are high during the daytime most of the year, during the nighttime also. Um, Are you still listening? I think someone had their microphone off, but please continue. That's not you this time. Okay. That was someone else. So please continue. <laughs> okay. And the temperatures on, on our city, on Fortaleza, are high during daytime most of the year. Uh, to clarify, the, our city has a very low thermal amplitude. We always have the same temperature during daytime and the night times always 30 degrees in Celsius scale. Uh, the next slide will illustrate more. The Fortaleza challenges, as such as the temperature that we face every day, the high temperatures that, that our city have during daytime and nighttime are really difficult for the pedestrians to face. We have 30 degrees all day long, all night long. And to compare with other types of scale, the temperature, this temperature is the same as 86 Fahrenheit degrees all day long, all night long. And the lack of a first station in most highly urbanized areas would uh, elevate even more the thermal sensation in the streets and the wide asphalted roads create heat islands in most urban areas. And to create the plan, we created the plan of walkability, searching for a sustainable urban development, taking as main goals, three of the sustainable development goals set, uh, created by the United Nations. One of them is to reduce by half global road fatalities and injuries. And the other one is to provide universal access to safe, inclusive, accessible, and green public spaces, particularly for women and children, older persons and persons with disabilities, and integrate climate change measures into national policies, strategies, and planning, which is what are we, do we are doing with the Master Plan for Workability in Fortaleza. This is a, a, a picture that Leticia also showed in her presentation, is the reverse, 
refers to traffic priority parameters which is our goal with the master plan of walkability in Fortaleza. Today, this pyramid is not reversed. The private vehicles are the priority in, the, in our city and in most cities around the globe with our wide roads and little sidewalks. But our, our master plan's main goal is to put pedestrians first, then cyclists, and then collective public transport and cargo transport, and then only then private vehicles. And the, the plan is to increase the attractiveness of traveling on foot by qualifying the existing infrastructure used for walking. And another guidelines of the Municipal Walkability Master Plan of Fortaleza are to ensure the completeness of displacement in neighborhoods, considering housing and works, uh, shortening the distance between these two things, and ensure access by walking to parks and squares, which we don't have always, but the plan is to increase the, the, the access to the parks and squares by walking and prioritize travel on foot in centralities and increase pedestrian safety at road crossings. To talk about more at the making of the making of, of the plan, the official document that the City Hall released in 2019, establishing the composition of the interdisciplinary net that made the products of the plan, the technical groups, there were five technical groups created by this official document. In 2020, we re-edited this official document, adding more people to these technical groups, which are methodology and diagnosis, strategic planning, reduced mobility, social engagement, and financial means. The social engagement involved in the making of the plan uh, uh, resulted in 25 work group, group, work group meetings, three participant workshops, and four public consultations to involve the population in general on the making of the plan. And in a long two years, the, the master plan resulted in eight books that we produced along these two years of intense writing, researching, consulting the population about the walkability in Fortaleza. We made the strategies book, the diagnosis book, the technical manual for sidewalks uh, destined to uh, revitalize our sidewalks in our city, the guide, the sidewalks that we want that we pursue in Fortaleza, the book of good practice and propositions for walkability, the financing methods book, and the social participation book, and the book of memories of the process of the, the master plan. In all, there are 97, 97 strategic, strategic actions related to topics in the plan, such as focal points, infrastructure, accessibility, environment, urban mobility, economy, public policy, and social programs. And the guidelines and strategic actions were formulations with the, were formulated with the aim of solving the challenges encountered during the over diagnosis prepared by the inter interdisciplinary and intersectoral network of the Municipal Walkability Master Plan of Fortaleza. And the city projects that put in action the Master Plan of Walkability in Fortaleza were made by another offices in the city hall, but they took the strategic actions that we have on the plan and put them on action, like these road interventions that I present to you on this slide, with the four pictures, there are all uh, street interventions destined to stimulate walking on centralities in many locations in Fortaleza. And 
Here we have some mobility and first childhood interventions made by the mobility phase in City Hall for the uh, to make the streets and the public spaces more attractive to child and the first childhood and uh, people in general. And here we have the another street intervention such as calm traffic areas, complete street projects, the safe corner program to in increase security at crossings and the extension of sidewalks. Uh, increasing the, the dimension of sidewalks in some streets in Fortaleza. And we have here some interventions in public spaces and in parks in Fortaleza, such as the children's city, the children's park that are in the center of Fortaleza, the center area. The micro parks, which is a program that we are now extending as a policy in the in the city and the requalification of the seafront of Para do Futuro, which is a beach that we have in Fortaleza. And we also have the mobility and urbanization works in Vila do Mar, which is a, 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 a resident location in Fortaleza. And to finalize, we have these two projects that simulate recycling in Fortaleza and the, the accessible beach project to make the beach in Fortaleza more accessible to everyone, also people with disability, and to simulate recycling in many locations in the city. Here we have the current team that monitors the, monitors the plan actions uh, there are, these are the people that work with me, monitoring the actions of the plan and the stakeholders, the other office, offices in City Hall that are involved in the plan. So thank you, obrigada, for the attention, and I'm glad to share this information with you. Obrigada, that's absolutely fantastic. I'm sorry for the technical hitches, but I'm really glad we managed to keep you. Um, on the screen. It's such a such a great story, so comprehensive. There is all those tragic numbers at the beginning around um, road safety and things, but the numbers I think I want to highlight from your presentation is eight notebooks, eight really yeah. solid documents to underpin the work. And I like that they were technical as well as social. It's really, really solid foundation. And then to translate that into action. And the other number I really like uh, which wasn't on the screen, but you have a team of seven. I think these are walkability squads that other places can only dream about having uh, these sort of resources to uh, to implement. So thank you so much for sharing. That's been absolutely uh, brilliant. We're going to move a bit further north, though not in Brazil, because we'd be off the off the land and into that lovely looking ocean. But we're going to go to Mexico now and to hear from Constanza Delon, who is the Director of Road Safety and Information Monitoring at the Mobility Secretariat of Mexico City, where she coordinates the programs to improve road safety conditions and the application of public policies to improve the way that people inhabit cities. She's got a background, particularly in active mobility, um, and she's here today to share with us some of the work they're doing for walkability in Mexico. Constanza, thanks for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Okay, uh, so I'm going to speak uh, to you about some of the actions to improve walkability and to protect pedestrians in Mexico City. Um, okay, so uh, a bit of the pedestrian context in Mexico City. Uh, we, we have over 5 million trips a day that are made only by walking. So we have a lot of people that are currently walking in the metropolitan area. 41% of these uh, trips are made within Mexico City, which is um, about 2 million trips every day. The average age of people who make these trips by walking 
is 34 years old. 61% uh, of these walking trips are made by women. And the main reason for travel is care activities, such as dropping off and picking up someone or going shopping. And the second main reason for traveling on foot is going to school. So these are uh, two vulnerable users that we have to focus on, women and children. Children under 15 years of age represent 28% of the trips in Mexico City and 32% of the metropolitan trips. Uh, with this data, we developed an integrated uh, mobility plan that has uh, the vision to place people at the center of urban mobility policies, ensuring that mobility system programs and projects are aimed to increase accessibility, reduce travel times, and guarantee comfortable and safe trips for all people, uh, regardless of the way they are moving. Uh, this program uh, is based on three different axes. The first one is to integrate the transportation system, especially walking, cycling, and public transport, to improve the infrastructure and services by increasing accessibility condition, uh, reduce transfer times, and improve travel conditions, and uh, one of the most important is to protect the vulnerable users by making these infrastructure and services inclusive, dignified, and safe. Uh, so I'm going to share some of the pedestrian specified projects. Uh, the first one is the Safe Intersections pro Program. This program uh, was developed by reviewing which intersections of the city concentrated the most amount of uh, crashes that included pedestrian victims. And uh, we defined which ones were the, the uh, priority ones, and then uh, specified these general design criteria for these uh, intersections, such as geometric adaptation, pedestrian traffic lightning, including, and also uh, drawing the outline of vehicle flows, um, placement of horizontal and vertical signs and uh, the construction of speed humps so that we uh, have um, areas that pedestrians could feel safer. Uh, also, this uh, safe intersections program included a phase of evaluation in which we uh, collected the data before the programs and after the, the interventions. And we had a variation that uh, reduced in between 20% to 30% the number of victims that um, collided in, in those intersections. So even though it's not the, the, the best result, we're still working to improve these conditions. This is one of the intersections uh, before and after. We uh, constructed some ramps. We um, improved the conditions for uh, disabled people and also changed the traffic, uh, traffic lights so that pedestrians could have more time to cross from one uh, section to another. Uh, other than the, uh, the intersections also included vegetation areas to make uh, the space more pleasant and more comfortable, universal accessibility criteria, and also uh, bollard barriers and tactile paving guidance so uh, that pedestrians uh, were protected and had uh, comfortable um, trips. We also have a program to remove anti-pedestrian bridges. And so far we have uh, removed five anti-pedestrian bridges around a specific areas such as uh, Metro and Metrobus station and replaced them with safe and accessible pedestrian crossings. Uh, there are still many bridges to remove, but it is a starting point. And uh, this is another bridge that we removed. Uh, this was a very important connection because in the nearby area, uh, there's a school and there's also a market. So uh, we had a lot of, we have a lot of, of pedestrian trips in this area and also a uh, metro station, the Gautemoc metro station. Also, we have uh, developed some improvements in the public transport 
uh, to make these trips easier. And uh, we have included different uh, universal accessibility um, criteria to uh, also change the, the buses to make them uh, easier to try to increase, even if you are on a wheelchair. Another uh, intervention, it's uh, the roads configuration in some of the main avenues of Mexico City, uh, such as Avenida Hidalgo, Avenida Valderas, and Avenida Chapultepec. These were um, avenues that uh, had a huge amount of vehicle lanes, and we had reduced those vehicle lanes, increased the pedestrian space, and um, developed a better public space criteria. And now I'm going to talk to you about the Socalo, uh, the pedestrian expand area of the Socalo. This is one of the most important squares of Mexico City, and it is located in the center of the city. In 1958, it um, had only a huge amount of vehicle lanes, and it uh, didn't have any marked crosswalk. And by the time of 2017, the, uh, there was a whole um, maintenance of the of the square, and uh, the the space of the plaza increased on one lane. But still, it had a lot of, of place that was specifically um, designed by cars, no? for cars. So in 2020, um, there was a reconfiguration project with a reduction of this vehicle lane, an intervention of the public space that included new areas of stay with the incorporation of urban furniture and a lot of vegetation. And it also had this design that um, it reminds of the, the patterns of the traditional Mexican textiles, the ones from Oaxaca. And um, this whole project uh, now is transformed into a place that everyone can use uh, with a lot of um, comfortable areas, a lot of lightning. And uh, even at night, it's a really crowded space that people enjoy walking by. So um, this was uh, recently intervened last year. And uh, now we can tell that it's a really successful project. Another uh, policy that we have, it's focused on women, since uh, women are the ones that walk the most in the, in the city. Uh, this is the project called Walk Free, Walk Safe Corridors, in which um, we chose these corridors and we increased lightning, improved urban infrastructure, and also install surveillance cameras and emergency buttons so that women that um, walk in these areas can have a, a, a perception of, of safety. Because uh, we believe that if a woman feels safe walking down the street, anyone else will feel safe in the same space. And also uh, another policy um, it's uh, focused on the school areas. Uh, we developed, with help of, of Bloomberg Philanthropies and Vital Strategies, a guide uh, for safe school environments in which we uh, delivered workshops to the local uh, the city halls and also developed some tactical urbanism interventions in these areas. Uh, some of these schools are in the most marginated zones of the of the city so uh, this guide tries to aims to to improve these uh, environments with a low budget and uh, also as an example of governance uh, we uh, delivered last month the walk and bike to school day um, this was an, um, a project delivered by the ministry of mobility the Isabel Mays Office and the Ministry of Public Education, all in coordination with the uh, Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, the ITDP. And uh, this project uh, wants to encourage safe and healthy school environments, also to promote walking and cycling to access schools and uh, to deliver physical activities in girls and boys. 
with this program, we um, did some walking to the schools of, of these kids and teenagers and uh, also checking uh, which parts of the streets they like, in which areas they didn't feel safe, etc. cetera. Uh, delivered some graphic materials and uh, a lot of workshops with their parents and also their teachers. So uh, this is a program that we are encouraging because we think that children have to know the right to uh, walk or bike to school in a safe way. And by that, we can change the way in the cities. So those are some of the examples of what we are doing in Mexico City. Thank you. Thank you, Constanza. That's a really comprehensive program as well. And uh, we had uh, War 21 conference in Mexico City in 2012. And there was one tiny little space in the middle of the city. Um, and I, I remember the, the spaces as they were before then and the changes that you are bringing and are happening there are really, really lovely to see. And uh, I like that Letitia started with the problem of those pedestrian bridges or so-called pedestrian bridges. You rightly label them anti-pedestrian or uh, vehicle enabling infrastructure, which is what they are. And it's great to see a program that is actually rolling out uh, a sort of a consistent uh, de uh, decommissioning, perhaps removal of those bridges. It's really great. Thanks yeah. so much for sharing the uh, the you. implementation work it's really good to see um and uh, we move now to montreal and to um hear from Bate Komorowski who is the team leader of the sustainable mobility strategies division in the urban planning and mobility department of the city of montreal and uh He's been very much responsible for their strategies and the sustainable street design guide, which is the integration of guidance on mobility, safety, universal accessibility and green infrastructure. And this is all the elements that we've been hearing very particularly about the importance of green, the importance of safety, the importance of really uh, solid infrastructure and universal accessibility. So I look forward to hearing the Montreal story. Um, over to you, Batek. The floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So, okay. So, do you see my presentation? We do. We see it and we hear you loud and clear. So, please go ahead. Great. <clears throat> so, um, just for a quick context, uh, Montreal, for those of you who don't aren't familiar, is 500 kilometers directly north of New York City as the crow flies. Um, we're a municipality of 1.8 million uh, with in a, in a metropolitan region of about 4.3 million. Uh, so <clears throat> Montreal uh, doesn't have, uh, we don't have a, a department specifically responsible for uh, walking and pedestrians. Uh, it's, it's basically considered the shared responsibility of our the whole uh, urban planning and mobility department, which I, I work in. Um, so I what I wanted to highlight here is that um, back in 2008, we um, put out a, a, a transportation plan, which which really changed it. It, it. it initiated a paradigm shift in our thinking about mobility um the plan included a pedestrian charter which laid out that walking should become a means of transportation that is preferred rather than um endured and um whoops sorry and um to this end uh yeah that to, to achieve this goal uh that montreal will provide pedestrians with a safe and satisfying environment for walking and um i just have a few examples here would illustrate what that actually means on the ground. So this is, um, for example, one intersection here that you can see that's been rebuilt um, since that plan has been adopted. And it really shows what that means on the ground. So you can see clearly how we've really increased the space available for pedestrians for walking, uh, reduced the space available for cars, gotten rid of all these um, 20th century pieces of uh, engineering, like the, the ramp on the lower left-hand corner, uh, shortened the pedestrian crossings, et cetera. 
And I mean, this is another great example, uh, which is um, <clears throat> which shows something we've done, been doing a lot, which is curve extensions at uh, at intersections. So thousands of these have been built since that plan was adopted. Uh, we're currently developing a new plan, which will replace that 2008 uh, transportation plan. And actually, it's something new that actually it's it's going to be an integrated um, urban uh, master plan and mobility plan. So uh, it's called the land use and mobility plan or or uh, the lump for short. Um, and again, we're really emphasizing uh, the importance, um, the primacy of pedestrians in this plan. So we've already put out a vision document, which, uh, which is sort of guiding the development of the plan. And in that vision document, we say that streets are designed foremost for the safety and comfort of pedestrians. So by 2050, we hope that the Vision Zero, our Vision Zero strategy will have been achieved and that we will have eliminated injuries and fatalities. And that walking journeys with or without assistance uh, provide a positive experience of the city in all seasons. So that's where we'd like to go, um, where we'd like to be by 2050. Um, and speaking of all seasons, <clears throat> uh, and this is sort of demonstrates how um, how uh, walking is is uh, is prioritized. Um, we clear uh, one hundred percent of our sidewalks, so that's about six thousand five hundred fifty kilometers of sidewalks are cleared during the winter. These are operations that usually start in December uh, and uh, go on until uh, uh, late March. Uh, sometimes this happens even a few times a day if there's a major snowfall. Uh, we start clearing our sidewalks as soon as there's two and a half centimeters of snow on the ground because it, it becomes difficult to walk uh, when there's more accumulation than that. And another important thing to note is that sidewalks are the first um, traveled uh, way to get cleared, uh, especially on secondary streets. We will clear the sidewalk much earlier than we will get to the road. Um, now, <clears throat> regarding current action plans at the city, I think the most important one to highlight is uh, our Vision Zero uh, action plan. Uh, we adopted Vision Zero back in 2016. Uh, this is our second three-year action plan. The first one covered the years 2019 to 21. Uh, the new plan, which came out this year, is uh, very much prioritizes uh, pedestrians. Uh, the reason being that pedestrians represent um, half of our fatalities and almost a third of uh, our serious injuries. Um, and you can see here the three in the three circles. These are um, the leading collision scenarios. Uh, that uh, with, that involve a pedestrian victim. So um, that's what we are prioritizing the plan. And on the left, on the right, sorry, you see uh, the five key themes that we're looking at um, to uh, improve pedestrian safety. Um, another program that we started back in 2019, which is related to Vision Zero, is our Safe Streets uh, Around Schools program. Um, what it what we do is we uh, fund uh, improvements um, around schools, which can include uh, sidewalk widening, curb extensions, traffic calming. Uh, we also fund cycling lanes. Uh, you see on the right uh, an example of a street that has been transformed with uh, funding from the program. Uh, so it illustrates really well what this program does. Um, so far, uh, we've uh, completed 67 uh, such projects, which cover um, 81 schools. There's more schools than projects because actually schools are sometimes clustered. So there's two schools side by side. So a single project can cover two schools. <clears throat> we have 30 more uh, uh, in the pipeline uh, coming up uh, next year. Um, we are also currently launching a, a program for uh, senior pedestrian safety. The reason being that uh, uh, see people 65 uh, years and uh, over are overrepresented, um, nearly double actually their share of the population in, um, in uh, pedestrian collisions. Um, in a way, we think it's actually, we're partly victims of our success in getting older people to walk. 
Uh, however, um, so there is more of an older active population that's walking, but they are uh, more impacted by uh, collisions. So um, we are starting this program to upgrade, especially major intersections around areas that we know uh, there is either an, uh, a higher population of senior citizens or uh, places also that we know attract uh, older um, pedestrians, such as shopping centers and also medical facilities. Uh, we have a major uh, uh, upgrade program underway to our uh, signalized intersections. So we are going to review all uh, 2,300 uh, signalized um, intersections and we'll, where there are, aren't already uh, pedestrian countdown signals, we'll be adding them. So at the end of the process, every single uh, signal controlled intersection will have countdown pedestrian signals. And um, even where there are already pedestrian countdown signals, we are retiming uh, all of the uh, uh, pedestrian signals to give pedestrians more time. So this is important. We're not only giving pedestrians more speed more space, but we're also giving them more time uh, at intersections. <clears throat> and uh, you see here, for those who are interested, uh, we have our uh, the speeds at which we are timing them, the walking speeds. Um, we're also adding lead pedestrian intervals uh, and protected phases where relevant. So for those who don't know, lead pedestrian interval is when the pedestrian light uh, comes before the green light. Um, so usually five or even seven seconds, sometimes before uh, the green light begins. <clears throat> uh, as of the pandemic, so since um, uh, 2020, we've launched a uh, summertime uh, pedestrianization program on um, commercial streets. So this is um, these are streets that are closed to vehicles um, starting usually in mid-May. And some of the projects are remain open until uh, October. Um, during the first year um, of the pandemic in 2020, we had 12 such projects. Um, that's now been reduced to eight uh, projects that have been given funding, uh, stable funding for the next few years. So at least until 2024. So it's a total of eight streets, 7.5 kilometers, which, um, which get closed every summer. And this is in addition to other uh, seasonal pedestrianizations that we already had in place. So this is up above and beyond uh, what we already had. And um, the way it works too, is that we subsidize, the central administration uh, subsidizes up to two thirds of the cost of the project. So it helps our boroughs um, finance these, these projects. Um, we also have another program, which, um, which is uh, really worth mentioning, which started in 2014. It's our uh, pedestrian and shared streets uh, program. Uh, this is a program under which uh, the central administration provides the boroughs with funding on the condition that they um, reallocate 60% of the road space to, uh, to pedestrians. Um, and the other interesting feature uh, is that um, it's a two-stage implementation. So there's first, they get money to do a pilot over a two-year period. Uh, we also give them, uh, provide them with um, evaluation. So we pay for uh, counts, uh, pedestrian traffic counts, and also a uh, um, uh, an expert uh, uh, that goes and does uh, observations on the street to make sure everything's working well and performs um, interviews also with users and um, shop owners and residents along the street to evaluate how well the project is performing. Uh, that's done between the first and the second year of the pilot. So in the second year, the, the uh, project can be adjusted. And then in every, if everything goes well, if, um, if the project is working well after the second year, um, the borough is provided with capital uh, funding to make the project permanent. So, so far um, we have, a, we have uh, accepted 22 uh, such projects, um, 11 of which have made it all the way to, uh, to a permanent phase. 
Um, five of them have been canceled for, for various reasons. Um, but in some cases, the projects didn't work out and, and uh, they, um, the borough wasn't satisfied with how it worked. So it didn't go to the permanent stage. Um, but the remainder, there are some that are still um, in, in their uh, pilot stage and uh, waiting to become uh, permanent. And um, I have here uh, an example of the three phases. So here you see the initial uh, state of the street. On the right, you see the temporary implementation. So that's experimenting its future configuration. And then here you have the, uh, you can see the final configuration after the, uh, the permanent project has been put in. So you see how vastly we've expanded uh, the space available to pedestrians here. <clears throat> I should mention that uh, unlike the um, commercial streets that I told you about earlier, which run only from May to October, uh, these projects are four season, though they are they have to be kept in place uh, year round. And that's actually a condition to get the uh, funding to do the permanent um, capital project. So, <clears throat> so that's it. So uh, I, that's a little bit of a, an overview of things that we're doing. And uh, thank you for uh, listening. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Bartek. That's super interesting. It uh, it's really great again to see the I hate to use the word, but the maturity of the program and the investment and the funding frameworks that you reference, and uh, to see central governments bringing forward money for local authorities to invest, but with with expectations on standards and and how that should be delivered. And this is we can't underestimate how new some of this is for this agenda you know like it really is very recent that this level of engagement and investment we're seeing and, and some of the examples that you've shared there have been um are really really fantastic um i'm going to open up the floor now to discussions uh please feel free to drop some questions into the chat i know there's been some conversations happening there um, already, but we've seen the importance of ensuring safety. And I like the, the Batek, you used the word satisfactory. I think satisfaction levels, lots of companies, public transport organizations use customer satisfaction as a measure of a, a performance indicator. And it's not something that we use in, um, in our public streets and spaces or our walkability. But, um, and this is a shameless plug, but we now have an app to actually measure that customer satisfaction for walking and walkability, because we saw that as one of those gaps. But you already have it captured in this idea that, that and we see that in the work that you're all doing, which is actually just making it nicer. Walking isn't just utilitarian. It should be satisfactory. It should be, it should be joyous. So I'm just waiting to see if anyone has um, some questions from the chat. Um, please do drop them in there, otherwise I'll lead off, because I've got a couple of very particular questions here. And what we're seeing is some really good rollouts of programs across this, across these cities, some really strong embedded um, walking plans and programs. And I liked that, Bartek, that you picked up on lump, as you called it, uh, but the integration of land use and urban mobility, that sort of level of, of sophistication in your city is, is really exciting. I, I wanted to understand around the funding streams. Let's talk about that as part of one of these key, because it's often very easy to generate investment for a singular capital project, or very often we rely on an external source to drop in and, and do these demonstration projects, which I think the jury is very well established now that these tactical urban and these demonstration projects are a game changer in this space. You know, ever since they arrived all those years ago in New York and the impact that they've had globally has been, has been brilliant. But are we seeing in cities like Mexico, um, Fort Laser and, and Montreal, are you seeing permanent funding streams for the work that you're doing for improving walkability? That, that it's becoming, it's not every year that you have to fight for your corner for the money, but that it's part of the overall planning and investment of the, of the city. Um, I might start with you, Bartek, since we've just finished and you've talked a bit about the different funding streams, but is it like a permanent budget line or is it something that has to be reinvented on a regular basis? Uh, mute, please. 
<laughs> Sorry. Uh, the the uh, central administration here in Montreal, um, we have a 10 year um, horizon for our capital investments planning. So uh, the usually the funding is quite stable um, mm -hmm. for the safe, uh, safe uh, streets around schools program, uh, as well as that new um, senior pedestrian safety program. We have stable funding uh, basically for the next 10 years. So the current administration wants those programs to, uh, to continue. Uh, and there's no, um, currently no limit actually so they're essentially programs in perpetuity so we'll can keep on doing them so yeah so very stable and predictable uh funding for uh, for those programs yeah great constanza if i can come to you with mexico city because i know that you know the work you're doing is still very new but you've been incredibly busy making a lot of big changes with some great support from important agencies like Bloomberg and Vital Strategies and things. And do you see, and I'm picking up on some of the questions in the chat as well, but also this funding, do you see this changing the fundamental approach of the city to the public space and to pedestrian infrastructure and therefore the embedding and the expectation that this work will be ongoing and embedded in the financial decisions? Uh, yes, I think it's going to be ongoing because we have uh, developed these uh, integrated mobility plans and also the law has been enforced to uh, reconsider the, the pyramid, the, the priority pyramid and also the vulnerable users. So in this way, we can assure that pedestrians can get the, the budget each year. And even though we have a, a variable budget each year, we still have the priority programs. So um, this is a way to, to assure that we are going to continue with uh, these interventions in public space and also on different sidewalks. I think that's a really good point, actually, about getting the legal frameworks in to support the investment, but also the accessibility, um, you know, the rights of people to have access and people, you know, to, to do that. I think that's a really great, this is all the pieces we have to put together to, yeah. to ensure that uh, in that, that priority. Um, I wonder, Deborah, if you're there, I can't see you on my screen. Um, are you there? Yeah, there you are. Hi, um, I'm here. I'm here. Do you have an embedded funding stream? Do you do you feel that the sort of with the planning that you've done in your seven people team, do you feel part of the infrastructure now as such, part of the furniture for delivering on the city? Yes, it's really rewarding to be part of the walkability master plan because we can see the guidelines and the strategic actions that we have write, have written in the plan made in action by the offices, the many offices in City Hall, and it's really rewarding seeing this public policy and this planning, the master planning, made in action by other people following the products, the eight books that we elaborated, and it's, it's happy every day, it's happiness every day. So can I ask a slightly tougher question then? And I, I'm doing this because it's the end of the three webinars and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm really keen. I'm going to ask all of you as well. Do you see that the work you're doing is having an impact on the investment in road building and the way that they provide for motorized infrastructure in your cities? Now, I know this is a little bit of a stretch, and uh, but I'm just wondering, because we heard from Letitia that the pyramid has flipped on paper, but not, not in real life. And we've seen some fantastic work. I take nothing from the work that's happened. But do you see it now having an impact on decisions around road building and motorized um, access yeah. and infrastructure? I, I see a beginning of a change in the mindset of uh, the investments and the financial means uh, uh, related to road uh, road making, but it's always difficult to modify these structures. that are so so old and so established, and to see a beginning is already a, a win for us here in Fortaleza. But it's absolutely the beginning. <laughs> 
Yeah, great. Perhaps I can come back to you, Constanza. Do you do you see do you see an, an impact on on sort of that broader road, you know, sort of investment in infrastructure, maybe widespread speed limit changes or anything around the with the work that you're doing for pedestrians and walking and safety? I think I that think it's been that, a sorry. Oh, can, uh, you can talk, Constanza. Okay, sorry. Um, well, I think that it, it has been uh, definitely a change, but still there is a lot of budget that still uh, that it's uh, that it's still being used for a specific vehicle infrastructure. And even though we have made uh, a huge development on on public transport, which is also uh, a bench of of um, pedestrian mobility. I think that we still uh, have a lot to to get into reducing this percentage of of the whole budget that it is still uh, specifically determined to to vehicle to specific vehicle infrastructure. So it's okay. been it's it's we're still in in the start in we're still in the beginning. I think that's a really interesting point, actually, this percentage of the transport budget. Um, there's a few places Ireland is giving 20 percent. Um, Nairobi is investing, you know, 20 percent. Now, 20 percent of your transport budget is often much bigger than anyone even imagines should be invested in in um, in this type of infrastructure. And yet we've seen in the statistics from all your presentations that we're talking about 40 percent, 30, 40, 50 percent of the mobility in a city, at least in Africa, we were talking around 60 to 70 percent imagine if we had that level of investment so I think it's I think that's really super interesting to see it, it takes nothing because we have to do walkability even if we don't do anything else we still have to do it but I was just curious to see how we can I'm always keen to see the next ripple and how we could impact on on some of those choices and some of those decisions um Bartek did you want to add anything on that in terms of an impact on the broader I mean you've moved into land use planning and mobility you've got all the great language and plans there, it sounds like you're developing a much more integrated. Is it seeing an impact on the investment in motorized sort of traditional transport infrastructure as well? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, uh, I, I are mean, you asking? Oh, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> sorry, Deborah, did you want to say something else? No, I'm just answering your last question that you made for me. Uh, uh, he, Nowadays, in our city, in Fortaleza, we are developing a project that is aligned with the, the guidelines of the master plan of walkability, that is the micro parks, and we have re re registered a, a, a grand interest, a big interest from the, from the financial institutions and the academic the, the academia, the academy, and we are beginning to see a change. <laughs> That's it. Great. Oh, thank you. No, fantastic. A very important thing to hear. Thank you for seeing, showing that you you are seeing that impact. Fantastic. Um, Bartek, if you want to pick that up quickly, and then Letitia, I'm going to come back to you for some final observations before we close for today. But uh, Bartek. Yeah, well, I would say that we're investing quite heavily now in uh, alternatives to the automobile. So uh, investments in public transportation have greatly increased. We're investing a lot in our cycling infrastructure as well and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and some of it isn't just a, so much a case of investment because we are rebuilding a lot of uh, streets that have old sewers that have over a uh, hundred year old sewer infrastructure. And so it's more of a, a question of uh, reallocating space than money because uh, from a financial point of view, it doesn't really change much whether you make the sidewalk wider or narrower. It's really a question of allotting the space to uh, pedestrians. So as I pointed out in my presentation, generally, we will not generally as a rule we uh give pedestrians more space the other thing i would mention quickly that we have to now we're obligated to invest in is green infrastructure so uh 10 percent of uh 10 to 15 percent of the investment when we upgrade a street has to be put into green infrastructure so which of, of benefits uh pedestrians as well because for, we're often talking about trees which provide shade and combat uh 
heat island effect. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, in a city like Montreal, heat islands are not your biggest problem. And it was really great that you talked about- They are in the uh, summer. Yeah, so you talked about we, the snow we, we, We're shivering now in the winter, but we have very hot and humid uh, weather in the summer and heat island effect is a big issue. So you have it there, yeah. And it's great to see your um, open streets, you know, pedestrianized streets and uh, seasonal streets. I remember when the first, you have 12, I think 12 summer Sundays or something like this, and it's great to see those happening. Um, and I really, I just wanted to comment on the snow plowing of sidewalks because it was pointed out by Caroline Criado, uh, Criado Perez in her book, looking at all the gender differences that we don't see. In fact, snow, snow plowing sidewalks is a gendered, um, has a gendered impact because of the levels of women who walk. And she did an analysis in Finland uh, around that, that snow plowing the streets um, tended to, to favor the favor the mail travel as, as opposed to the sidewalk. Um, and so it's interesting the layers that we have to be thinking about with our work. Yes, Batek. Well I just wanted to quickly point out that our summertime street it's not Sundays, it's it's there the streets are closed completely from mid-May till mid-October. Seven days gonna... 24 hours a day. Yeah, I know. I think that's fantastic. When I was working in Canada in 2007, it was just literally Sundays and often they put old cars in the streets as well for people to come and have a look at. So it's fantastic to see that. It's absolutely great. Letitia, we're running just a few minutes over time. Thank you for staying with us. Um, but uh, Letitia, back to you for any sort of reflections or comments that you would like to um, share. It was really great to see the all examples and how we are connected in very like particular points on the way we promote and the areas and the vulnerable uh, pedestrians are the same like we share these so we have specific plans for these kind of things i just wanted to point out that um we i think we like in the region have been very uh, creative on budget and pedestrians that's why tactical urbanism became so popular because there is not much budget, but a lot of intention and in changing it. So I think we have to see that it as a good sign of the region. And now we have to like just change the face and showing with this tactical urbanism that we really need more investment and more planning. But I do believe that the case of Fortaleza is very interesting and planning before having the budget, because when the budget comes, you already know what you're going to do with this budget. Exactly. So I think yeah. that's a very good uh, point of view of I, this case. I think that's a great point. And COVID demonstrated that the cities that had plans in place were able to act more quickly and, and more effectively in response to the in response to that change in demand. I am going to have to close it. We've run a few minutes over time. But unsurprisingly, it's been fantastically interesting and inspiring because, as we know, there's so much you can do to make walkability better if you don't have any impact on other, you know, vehicle movements in your city. And yet we see both things happening. We see making it safer, making it nicer rewarding people with space whether they want to sit there or whether they want to walk there and for children and for the elderly as well it's been really inspiring thank you so much to our speakers thank you to the audience for your engagement in the chat and for being part of the of this webinar but we also invite you to be part of the platform and to bring your your case studies and your ideas and keep an eye out as we roll out more uh, materials and resources and uh, work associated with the with the platform and as i had to clarify from the last session then we can have more than one case study from each place so don't feel like if your city has a case study that's it that's ticked please uh, come and share it with us and we can start moderating and highlighting those thank you finally to ralph for all your technical support and organization in bringing us all together and again thank you to the fia foundation who have made this work um, possible the recordings will be on youtube and we are following up with our speakers to share the presentations so thank you so much everyone